There was a hiccup. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 times the internet solved crimes. Finally, we knew. For this list, we're looking at the most interesting true crime cases that were resolved by amateur internet sleuths. Which of these stories fascinates you the most? Let us know in the comments below. Number 20, Tent Girl. The body of Barbara Ann Hackman Taylor was found wrapped in a tarp on May 17, 1968, and was presumed to be the victim of a homicide. Her nickname Tent Girl came as a result of the material she was found wrapped in and because her real identity wasn't known yet. Years after Tent Girl was found, a man named Todd Matthews married the daughter of the man who first discovered the body. Knowing that the case troubled his father-in-law, Matthews began digging on the internet. He scoured public databases and missing persons websites until he found a match. The Hackman family had posted a report about their missing relative, whose story seemingly matched Tent Girl's. Contact was made, authorities were notified, and Tent Girl was positively identified. Number 19, The Linda Jane Hart Case. WebSleuths.com is where amateur detectives gather to discuss cold cases, and they all share one primary mission, to solve what the police could not. One sleuth is Carl Koppelman, who once worked as an accountant for Disney. He took to perusing the website and started moderating a forum for unidentified victims. The object of this forum is to locate missing persons by cross-referencing coroner's reports. Through his involvement, Koppelman was able to identify Linda Jane Hart, who had been missing since 1988. Hart's remains were found in an abandoned parking lot, but she was initially categorized as a Jane Doe. It wasn't until 2011 that Koppelman's investigative skills would lead to her identification. Number 18, Anthony Posey's Stolen Camera. And now for something a little lighter. Louisiana-based professional photographer Anthony Posey traveled to Seattle for his wife's 50th birthday and decided to visit the city's public library while he was there. Unfortunately, he left his camera in one of the bathrooms, and when he returned, the camera was gone. He posted a help ad on Craigslist, but didn't hold out much hope. Nevertheless, police soon recovered a stolen camera and used the community posting website nextdoor.com to publicize their find. One of its users recognized the camera from Posey's Craigslist ad and connected the dots. And with that, the professional photographer was reunited with his camera. Number 17, Operation Death Eaters. Founded in 2014 by a woman named Heather Marsh, Operation Death Eaters would later become associated with the hacktivist group Anonymous, which garnered it greater media attention. Dear citizens of the world, the time for truth has arrived, a time for freedom and transparency, a time for people to express themselves freely and to be heard from anywhere across the world. The goal of the operation is to find and expose those dealing in human trafficking and predation. Despite the involvement of Anonymous, there is actually no hacking involved. Rather, the participants use good old-fashioned research and investigative methods in an attempt to remain legitimate. The group is looking into both individuals and entire institutions, including the U.S. military, which they argue govern themselves and therefore cannot be trusted to mete out justice properly. It's unclear if the operation has led to any arrests, but there's no denying that their intentions are noble. Number 16, the Reddit recounting. During a friend's engagement party at a Seattle bar, 26-year-old Sam Whitehorn was assaulted by three men. According to Whitehorn's girlfriend, Bridget Kitson, his Green Bay Packers hat attracted the attention of the men, who were fans of the Seattle Seahawks. As a result of the attack, Whitehorn hit his head on the curb. The fall fractured his skull and put him in a coma. Kitson recounted the story on Reddit, which quickly went viral. A resulting police investigation later found and identified the three suspects. According to a post made by Kitson, the suspects proceeded to turn themselves in. Number 15, Billy Jensen's geo-targeted ads. A digital media consultant named Billy Jensen has emerged as one of the most accomplished amateur sleuths working today, with the solving of a purported 10 homicide cases under his belt. I wanted to solve these murders myself, and I came up with a system on how to do it. Jensen once worked as an investigative journalist, and his experience in the field of crime reporting has paid dividends. Jensen uses geo-targeted ads on social media to attract the attention of locals and uses their witness reports to suss out criminals. If you're able to target the specific people that you want to target in a specific area and say, hey, do you know this guy? You're going to get a lot better response. One specific case solved by Jensen was the killing of Marcus Gaines. With the help of local photos and videos, Jensen was able to identify the perp as Marcus Moore. I started, you know, 
kind of fumbling in the dark, started a social media campaign and was able to actually find someone who was there that took a video of the event. And I was able to take that video, match it up with pictures of, uh, of mugshots and was able to identify the, uh, the puncher. Jensen has since written two books about his exploits, Chase Darkness With Me and Killer Amidst Killers. Number 14, The Jacob Wetterling Case. In 1989, 11-year-old Jacob Wetterling was abducted by a masked assailant while biking home with his younger brother and friend. The case remained cold for decades until Joy Baker got involved. It would take nearly three decades for a break in the case. A man named Jared Shirel claimed that he survived a similar encounter in the 80s, and both he and Baker began to unravel the years-long mystery. That case was too old to prosecute, but there was DNA evidence from it. That DNA evidence, enough to get a search warrant for Heinrich's home. They unearthed a number of related stories, leading to their appearance on CNN's The Hunt. This then attracted the attention of authorities, who ordered that the Wetterling case be reopened. An old DNA sample was found and matched to a man named Danny Heinrich, who would eventually reveal the location of Wetterling's remains. He's not getting away with anything. We got the truth. Number 13, the shooting of Crystal Theobald. The 2021 Netflix documentary, Why Did You Kill Me?, tells the story of Crystal Theobald and her family's desperate search for justice. I look over and he's standing there, right by the stop sign. Theobald was killed in 2006 when a local gang mistakenly believed the car she was riding in belonged to rival gang members. They shot at the car in a drive-by, killing Theobald and wounding her boyfriend. Theobald's mother, Belinda Lane, took to MySpace with a fake account to befriend members of the gang. She connected with a man named William Satello, who admitted that he and a few others were involved in the shooting. In the end, Satello was charged with voluntary manslaughter, while Julio Heredia, the shooter, was found guilty of first-degree murder. Number 12, Anonymous and Retea Parsons. After attending a high school party where she was sexually assaulted, Retea Parsons was further maltreated when photos of the assault were spread online. The photos also made their way through Parsons' hometown of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, under the stress of it all, Parsons attempted to take her own life and ended up in a coma. From the start, police messed up, interviewing Parsons not once, but twice. Her family eventually had to make the incredibly difficult decision to terminate her life support. The story attracted the attention of Anonymous, who reportedly identified the guilty parties. They demanded that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police enact justice, or they would publicly reveal the names. We encourage you to act fast. If we were able to locate these boys within two hours, it will not be long before someone else finds them. There are varying accounts of what happened subsequently to this, but it seems at least two of the suspects were identified by the RCMP. Number 11, Andrea Bowman. Amateur sleuth Carl Koppelman strikes again, this time solving the case of teenager Andrea Bowman. Bowman was suffering abuse from her adoptive father, Dennis, before she vanished from his home. The case went cold for decades until authorities in Hamilton, Michigan arrested Bowman in November. Koppelman began digging around online years later and stumbled across an active classmates.com page in Bowman's name. He contacted the owner and discovered that it was Bowman's biological mother. The two investigated the case together and came to the conclusion that Bowman's abusive adoptive father was most likely responsible for her disappearance. Police, in turn, eventually took his DNA and linked it to a prior murder. Knowing that he was caught, he then confessed to killing Andrea as well. Number 10, Brad Willman's Trojan Horse. Back in the late 90s, a Canadian man named Brad Willman devised a Trojan horse that allowed him complete access to the computers that downloaded it. Willman placed the Trojan horse on websites dedicated to predators, and at the height of Willman's activity, he was monitoring up to 3,000 computers. These belonged to a wide variety of people, including priests, social workers, police officers, and military personnel. His program aided in numerous official channels, including a Kentucky state investigation and a case involving the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. But perhaps his biggest catch was Superior Court Judge Ronald Klein, who pleaded guilty to possessing explicit material and was sentenced to 27 months in prison. Number 9. Finding Sean Power's Laptop A Canadian web consultant named Sean Power was the victim of a laptop thief while visiting New York City. After returning home to Canada, a tracking tool called Prey alerted Power that his computer was in use and provided screenshots of the user. The man logged into Skype using his real name, giving Power his name, face, and location. His 12,000 Twitter followers then banded together, 
with one discovering that he was the owner of a restaurant called Oficina Latina. Um, so it was kind of clear intent that they kind of wanted to keep the laptop, which is fine, I guess, but um, I guess when he was confronted with the fact that we had pictures of him in his bank account, he changed his mind. Powers sent a female friend to investigate, and a Twitter follower named Nick Reese ventured to the restaurant on behalf of Powers. They were able to reclaim the bag and the laptop, and Powers called the perp to thank him for returning his belongings. Number 8. iPad Selfies That pesky cloud and its penchant for stopping criminals. Now, the things you do on your phone are everywhere you want them. Automatically. In January of 2015, Randy Schaefer woke up to find his truck broken into. Missing was a bag containing cash, an iPad, and a MacBook. After informing the police, Schaefer realized that some pictures had been uploaded to his iCloud account. There were several pictures. There's about 15 pictures. Schaefer uploaded the photos to Click2 Houston's Facebook page and received 11,000 shares. Meanwhile, his friend shared the photos on Reddit, and a user recognized one of the perps from high school. The friend was linked to the Facebook account of one Dorian Walker Gaines, where they found a video of the man flaunting his newfound cash. Don't don't worry about no how. No 20s, no 20s, no 5s, no 10s. I'm... Read it. See Big face. face. The authorities were alerted, and the perps were promptly arrested. Number 7. Virginia Hit and Run On April 7, 2012, a 57-year-old woman was killed in a hit and run in Virginia. No description of the car was provided, and the only thing police had to go on was a small piece of metal that broke off the car upon impact. They posted a photo of the piece online, and it was quickly picked up by car enthusiast website Jalopnik. Its users quickly identified the metal as the grill from a Ford F-150. They narrowed it down to the exact year and trim level, and the police used this information to build their case. It eventually led them to Victor Espinoza and Juan Gonzalez Vasquez, both of whom were arrested and slapped with hit-and-run charges. Number 6. The Steubenville High School Case This very public and controversial case involved a crime perpetrated against a 16-year-old high school student. It appears that the uh, juvenile victim attended a party, and we're still waiting to find out exactly what happened from there may have happened in several locations, both in the city and outside the city. The act was graphically disseminated through social media, with dozens of people documenting the event through text messaging and social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Many of these posts were found and publicly released by crime blogger and amateur sleuth Alexandria Goddard. Alexandria Goddard is a crime blogger who posted all the messages and all the names of the boys involved, even those who had not been charged with any criminal wrongdoing. Extra footage was leaked by an anonymous offshoot known as NightSec. Both were paramount in publicizing the Steubenville case and making it national news. And then all of a sudden, some guy comes on, he's not even from the area, and he's like, I'm coming for you. She's passed out. It's not okay. The information was also responsible for exposing the perpetrators, both of whom were convicted and sent to juvenile detention for one and two years, respectively. That both of the defendants are hereby adjudicated delinquent beyond a reasonable doubt on all three counts as charged. Number 5. Philadelphia Swarm In this horrible case, over a dozen people attacked a gay couple on the streets of Philadelphia while making disparaging remarks about their sexual orientation. The attack has outraged the city and raised concerns about the law. The police released surveillance video of the incident, and a Twitter user named Greg Bennett posted a Facebook photo of what looked like the assailants in a nearby restaurant. Bennett claims that the photo was sent to him by a friend of a friend of a friend. The restaurant was identified as La Viola, and user at Fansince09 cross-checked Facebook for people who had checked into La Viola that night. They found numerous matches, and Twitter now had names. The names were given over to police, and Detective Joseph Murray thanked them for their efforts. Number 4. The Death of Gregory May Back in 1995, cousins of Ellen Leach went missing, and this eventually inspired the Mississippi resident to become a web sleuth dedicated to finding missing persons around the country. In the early 2000s, a skull was found inside a bucket of concrete, and a clay reconstruction of its human face was produced. Web sleuth Leach found a match with one Gregory May, a missing antiques dealer who was robbed by his roommate. 
The roommate, Douglas De Bruin, had stolen May's antiques collection worth $70,000 and was going to trial for May's potential murder. The only problem was the lack of a body. Fortunately, the skull was indeed matched to May, and De Bruin was convicted and sent to prison for orchestrating his death. Number 3. The Case of William Francis Melcher Dinkle This married father of two perused chat rooms and posed as a depressed 20-something woman. He would then enter into fake death packs with despondent people, often providing them with detailed instructions. In November of 2006, a retired school teacher named Celia Blay got word of one Lee Dow who had made a death pact with her friend. Blay investigated Lee Dow and found other aliases and prior pacts. The police were not interested, so Blay set up a sting operation in which she was able to track the user's IP address to William Francis Melcher Dinkle in Minnesota. The St. Paul Police Department apprehended the man, and he was convicted on two counts. He spent 178 days in prison. Number 2. Abraham Shakespeare While buying cigarettes at a Florida convenience store in 2006, Abraham Shakespeare decided to try his luck and bought some lottery tickets. Those tickets made him $17 million richer. Shakespeare bought himself that new car, fancy new house, and lots more. But as so often happens, this lotto winner's drama didn't stick to the script. That's because the money also brought unwanted attention. A lady named Dee Dee Moore then started a business with Shakespeare and gave herself full control over the funds. So when Shakespeare later went missing, police immediately suspected Moore. In the beginning, we thought he was missing, that he was hiding away. As the investigation continues, the evidence mounts that he could have died because of sinister means. Murder, we're talking here. Could be. She in turn claimed that Shakespeare had gone to live somewhere remote, having grown sick of the constant requests for money. Prosecutors paint a picture of Moore as a conniving manipulator, intent on taking Shakespeare's cash. Web sleuths also blamed Moore. And when an anonymous user logged in to defend Moore's name, their IP address was traced. It led directly to Moore herself. Cold, calculated, cruel. They all apply. Manipulative, probably the most manipulative person that this court has seen. She was later arrested for the death of Shakespeare, as his body was found in the backyard of her house. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Luca Magnata And so I was on Facebook one day and I found a post. A lot of people have been feverishly posting about a video that was online. In 2010, a video was posted online depicting violence against animals. This resulted in the creation of a Facebook group intent on identifying the perpetrator. Eventually, the amateur sleuths were tipped off to the name Luca Magnata, perhaps by Magnata himself. Of course, what you're gonna do, you Luca Magnata, hit enter. And oh my god, it just like hit, he just. I don't know how to explain my reaction to what the results were. The group was able to match their clues to publicly available photos of Magnata, proving successful in their hunt. Then in 2012, Student Jun Lin was killed in Montreal, Canada, and the graphic video depicting his death further drew the group's attention. It was no longer a game of online, this was real world. They were able to help link Magnata to the killer in the video. Magnata was eventually traced by police to Berlin and extradited back to Canada, where he was sentenced to life in prison. They finally caught him. And it was just like the perfect way for Luca to go down. Luca was caught in an internet cafe because he couldn't stay away from his vanity. Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.